Hey everyone, Carlson here to start our adventure into the integumentary system, which is covered in Chapter 5 of our textbook. And our integumentary system includes our skin, hair, nails, and various glands. So this is basically the most visible organ uh, that results in us paying a lot of attention to it. So problems are usually obvious. Uh, physicians will pay attention to changes in color, flexibility, or sensitivity to the skin, which will provide clues about problems in other systems. We also call our skin the integument or the cutaneous membrane, and it's just one of two major components of the system as a whole. The other components include your hair, nails, and exocrine glands. But let's start off with the general structure. Um, your most superficial layer of your skin is going to be the epidermis, that you can see here. Um, then we move into the dermis, which is this much larger middle layer of connective tissues. Um, the hypodermis is this lower region here. It's loose connective tissue that separates the integument from deeper tissues and organs. It's also called the subcutaneous layer. And often it's not considered part of the system, but because it's interwoven with connective tissue of the dermis, we're going to talk about its importance. Now, five major functions include protection, so um, the integument is going to cover tissues and organs from impacts, chemicals, and infections. It also prevents loss of body fluids. Temperature maintenance, it's going to regulate heat exchange. Uh, synthesis and storage of nutrients, specifically it makes vitamin D and stores large reserves of lipids. Sensory reception is our nervous system connection, so there are receptors that can detect uh, touch, pain, pressure, and temperature. And then, of course, excretion and secretion through those glands. We can secrete salt, water, and organic waste. There's also specialized glands that can secrete milk. Now, the first section is going to cover the details of the epidermis, which are the strata or layers, and they have various functions. So the layers are um, composed of stratified squamous epithelium, and there are two types, uh, the thick and the thin. Now, the thick and the thin really just refers to the relative thickness of the epidermis, not the integument as a whole. The thick is going to be found in your palms of your hands and soles of your feet, and it's kind of like the thickness of a paper towel, while the thin covers the rest of the body in four layers instead of five, and it's kind of like a uh, plastic sandwich bag type thickness. Um, if we started from the basement membrane to the free surface, we go in the order of basale, intermediate, and corneum, where the intermediate strata is composed of uh, up to three other layers. So the basale is the deepest layer. It attaches to the basement membrane. It forms epidermal ridges that extend into the dermis to increase uh, the area of contact. And um, this the skin surface is also going to follow these ridges and create our fingerprints. There are dermal papillae that extend upward between the ridges and that's going to help us uh, diffuse nutrients from dermal blood vessels because the epidermis is a vascular. And then we, of course, have stem cells or basal cells that continuously divide to push new cells up through the strata. And there are sensory cells and melanocytes squeezed in between um, the layers here. Now, we move up another level into the intermediate layers. Uh, they're going to progressively displace as the cells specialize. And as stem cells divide, they move into the stratum spinosum. Then we move into the stratum granulosum, which is a grainy layer where cells have actually stopped dividing. And uh, here we're going to make large amounts of keratin protein. It's durable and wa water resistant, coats the surface, and is a basic structure of hair, nails, and calluses. In some animals, it would produce horns, hooves, feathers, and baleen plates, specifically in whales. Uh, the stratum lucidum is only in thick skin, and that would be the next layer up before we uh, reach the corneum. Now, it's important to know that the lu uh, lucidum is basically uh, keratin. It's just a lot of it is accumulated as the cells have been moved up. Now the corneum is the exposed surface of 15 to 30 layers of flattened and dead epithelial cells, normally, you know, references epi for short. They're said to be keratinized or cornified because of the large amounts of keratin protein. And uh, they're tightly connected by those desmosomes, so they're usually lost in sheets or large groups, not just one at a time, which is why we can see them when they get sloughed off. And this area is rel relatively dry, uh, leaving it unsuitable for growth of microorganisms, which is a good thing uh, for us as far as health is concerned. Uh, this picture here shows you the layers uh, in it of thick skin because you have uh, the lucidum included here. Uh, the granulosum is right underneath, and then you have the spino uh, spinosum, and finally your basale and your basement membrane. Uh, moving back up is where the corneum uh, is and the very surface is the area that's starting to get sloughed off, which is what's kind of happening here. 
Um, now, important to note, it takes about seven to 10 days for the cell to move from the vasale, so from down here all the way to the corneum. Uh, what's happening is cells will displace because of oxygen and nutrient supplies being depleted. It's gonna pack with keratin, will finally die and remain in the corneum for about two weeks until it sheds off or gets washed away. Now there are factors that influence our skin color and those are the epidermal pigments and dermal circulation. So um, two pigments we're mostly concerned with are carotene and melanin. Carotene is an orange yellowish pink uh, pigment seen in uh, many vegetables, especially in carrots, that's what makes it orange. Uh, can be converted into vitamin A to aid in tissue maintenance or synthesis of photoreceptor pigments in the eye. Uh, melanin then on the other hand is brown, yellow brown to black. Uh, melanocytes will manufacture and store melanin and production slowly increases in response to sunlight exposure. Now uh, melanin actually helps prevent skin damage by absorbing our UV radiation so it concentrates around the nuclear envelope to keep radiation from reaching the DNA and our skin color reflects the level of melanin produced not the amount of melanocytes that we have we all relatively have the same amount of melanocytes. Now areas where there is a greater than average amount of melanin production are usually going to have freckles or a darkened appearance because there's more melanin being produced. Now our dermal circulation is referring to our blood um, and oxygen, oxygenated blood is bright red that results in blood vessels in the dermis giving skin a reddish tint um, which is seen in lighter skin colors. Now if our vessels will, would widen or dilate for some reason, uh, like say if our temperature increases, the red tone becomes more apparent or more pronounced because the skin acts like a radiator and loses heat. Now if the opposite happens, say if you are frightened really quickly and your vessel is constricted, you would have a palish or a more palish uh, skin than you did before. Uh, finally, cyanosis is when the skin takes on a bluish coloration, usually due to some kind of um, disorder and uh, usually it's resulting from a reduction in circulatory supply it can be caused by cold um, extreme cold respiratory disorders like heart failure or severe asthma now sunlight is beneficial and is detrimental to us um, its exposure to UV, uv radiation actually allows the cells in the stratum spinosum and basale to convert a steroid into vitamin d3 vitamin d3 is absorbed modified and released by the liver uh, the kidney converts it to the hormone calcitriol and that hormone is going to aid in the absorption of calcium and phosphorus by the small intestine. Um, if we have inadequate vitamin D3, it can lead to abnormally weak and flexible bones. Now the detrimental side of this is skin cancer. Uh, there are common forms which are the basal cell carcinoma and the squamous cell carcinoma, but less uh, common than the basal cell. Uh, but both um, don't normally metastasize, they don't normally spread. Uh, so there's a high survival rate you know, through the removal of the tumor. However, the extremely dangerous type of skin cancer is malignant melanoma. This begins as a mole anywhere in the body, and what's going to happen is the melanocytes will grow rapidly and metastasize through the lymphatic system, and survival depends on when you detect it and how you treat it. But all can be prevented by wearing sunscreen, which is very important. So the dermis lies beneath the epidermis and has two major components, the papillary layer and the reticular layer. Uh, the papillary layer, layer is named after the dermal papillae, consists of areolar tissue that supports and nourishes the epidermis with those nerves and capillaries because uh, the epidermis again is a vascular. The reticular layer consists of an interwoven mesh network of dense irregular connected tissue. Uh, there are elastic fibers there that provide flexibility uh, while collagen fibers limit that flexibility to prevent tissue damage. Now a few more details about the dermis. It contains a mixed cell population of connected tissue proper as well. Uh, the accessory organs from the epidermis extend into the dermis, uh, your hair and sweat glands to be particular. And then other organ systems are going to interact with skin through the connection to the dermis. Uh, so your blood vessels include your cardiovascular system, lymphatic vessels, lymphatic system. Both of these help local tissues defend and repair themselves after injury or infection. And then of course we have nerve fibers that control blood flow, adjust gland secretion rates, and monitor sensory receptors. So that's our connection to the nervous system. Now our blood supply to the skin arises from a network of blood vessels in the hypodermis at its border with the reticular layer of the dermis and this is called the cutaneous plexus. Um, and it's an area where they meet and here we're going to provide nutrients and oxygen and remove carbon dioxide and waste products. Uh, lastly the hypodermis this connects the dermis to the underlying tissues. It's also known as a subcutaneous layer 
It's an extensive network of connective tissue fibers, again, attaching the dermis to the hypodermis. It has an indistinct boundary, helps the skin stabilize position relative to underlying tissues, um, but also permits movement. It also consists of areolar tissue with many fat cells. Um, this fat actually provides that baby fat for infants and children to reduce heat loss. It also serves as an energy reserve and shock absorber. And then it will actually, uh, the distribution will change as we age. Uh, finally, it's quite elastic and below its superficial layer contains few capillaries and no vital organs. Uh, and for this reason, the subcutaneous injection is a useful method for administering drugs uh, using a hypodermic needle. So when you ever get like a vaccination, this is usually the area they inject. And we're going to go ahead and stop there and we'll catch up with the other half later.